Well, can you? Hello, everybody. I, I'm going to talk about a 25 year long rancorous, rancorous dispute um, about what should be done with the dilapidated church of Holy Trinity Blytheborough, which was closed as unsafe in 1881. Now, on the one hand, there was a succession of um, vicars. Um, Restoration Committee um, members, and they wanted to restore the church to make it fit for further worship. They wished to dispose of centuries of unsightly repairs and, when necessary, um, replace um, dilapidated uh, medieval fabric uh, with new work. On the other hand, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, um, SPAB for short, um, saw the work of the restorers as likely to remove the historic uh, interest and character of the church. Uh, SPAB wished to have a sensitive repair. Uh, they deplored the removal of any even decayed medieval fabric and thought it should be repaired. Um, Spab's approach was viewed by the restorers as simply propping up a ruin. The, the dispute is very well documented. On the Spab side, we've got a very comprehensive archive. And from Blytheborough, we have um, the Restoration Committee's minute book. We, we have vestry minutes, we have church wardens accounts, uh, numerous architects reports, letters and articles from newspapers uh, uh, because the battle was fought in, in the public press. But first let, let's orientate ourselves. Blyber is a small village about four miles inland from, from the Suffolk coast. It's about as far east in England as you can get. Um, and it's on the river, River Blythe. Um, it's still tidal at Blytheborough. And other names to note on this map are Walberswick. Walberswick is a community with, with a, a distinctive character and history, but it was always part of the same medieval manor as Blytheborough uh, and shared a medieval lord. And also it was um, a shared church living with Blytheborough. And indeed the vicar lived at Walberswick. Other names to note on this map are the small so seaside town of Southwold on the other side of the River Mouth and going further north the hamlet of Covehithe also on the coast. Now Blyborough, Walberswick and Southwold uh, and Covehithe all had um, new grand 15th century churches. They, they formed a, a, a Suffolk coastal group. And here's the Grand Church of Blyborough um, overlooking the river and overlooking its village and uh, hence its title, uh, the Cathedral of the Marshes. Now all these churches had much the same design. Um, there was no chancel arch, um, there was a wooden screen and a continuous roof all the way through the nave and chancel. Uh, they had uh, north aisles, south aisles, and south porches. In, in Blyther's case, the tower was uh, of the 14th century rather than 15th century. And here in Blyborough, we have a North Isle Chapel dedicated to, to St. Anne, um, normally known as the Hopton Chapel after the name of the Lord of the Manor when the church was rebuilt. That is John Hopton who died in 1478 and his altar tomb is located here. Uh, and at the end of the south aisle, we have um, a vestry. Library today is, is noted um, for its fine painted angel roof, um, its medieval bench ends, and its original um, brick floor. Uh, this is Bible Day. It's also noted and is characteristic for the immense amount of light that, that floods in. 
But in 1881, um, this notice appeared in the London newspaper, the Morning Post. Now, uh, today it would qualify as fake news. Uh, there are so many errors in it. Uh, Blytheborough is in Suffolk, uh, not Norfolk. Um, the church does not have a hammer beam roof. Um, it's not of the 13th century, but um, in two respects, this article is accurate. Um, Blytheborough was in a very dilapidated state and the bishop had closed it. Now, there can be no doubt about the deplorable state of Libra because visitors had uh, commented it, commented on it uh, over the years. This view of the middle of the 19th century, you can see that um, the tracery in some of the windows had gone. Uh, they had now had William, uh, wooden mullions and transoms and, and the windows were partly blocked. Uh, this, this picture doesn't show that most of the clear story windows were blocked as well. You, you have blocked windows in the porch here. Numerous visitors uh, had uh, expressed their concern. In 1808, one of them described um, the windows blocked with red brick and, and, and the angels were falling. And John Hopton's tomb, which I've mentioned, um, uh, the canopy was su supported by clumsy square columns of, of red brick. And uh, that visitor wrote, um, also a wit, um, he wrote that John Hopton, whatever he might have been in his lifetime, was now unquestionably a, a firm supporter of the church. But um, there's nothing funny about um, the, the, the state of, of Blytheborough Church. Um, visitors use such words as sad state of mutilation, decay, a sore scandal, a splendid ruin. Now, Green streams were flowing down the walls, so there, there were shrubs growing in the North Isle, and, and worshippers were um, wise to uh, bring umbrellas with them. And if you were sitting in the aisles, you might be peppered with fragments of glass blown up, blown up by gusts of wind. Um, uh, there was even a risk of being hit uh, by a, a falling angel, uh, and the place was certainly tottering to its death. Um, this is the uh, nave and chancel uh, before restoration. You, you can see that the great east window has completely lost its tracery. Uh, you can see the screen has survived in the aisles um, covered in white paint, but the screen in the center has gone. Um, here are medieval um, bench ends, but on this side they have been obscured by um, box pews, uh, described by the local press as looking like sheep pens. There were fine 15th century um, stalls in the Hopton Chapel. Um, somehow they um, escaped the attention of the 17th century iconoclasts uh, because they were then in use um, as uh, benches in the schoolroom. And uh, in the um, 1870s, they were transferred into the chancel for use as choir stalls, and that, that's where they are today. Now, how had things uh, come to this sad state? Well, Blytheborough has a very, very long ecclesiastical history. Um, it had a church in the middle of the seventh century. It, it's probable that that church um, developed into an Anglo-Saxon minster, uh, and Blytheborough was a place of pilgrimage. Um, Doomsday Book records that the church was one of the richest in Suffolk, which is saying something, given that Suffolk could have been the richest uh, county in England. Um, the rich church, um, Doomsday Church, um, was um, granted um, to Augustinian canons um, by um, King Henry II um, because the Bible was then part of the royal estate. And uh, Bible's rich church then became um, uh, the Church of the Blessed Virgin Mary at, at the centre of Blyber Priory. And it's crucial that the Priory, um, even, or the rich church, even at Doomsday, had two dependent churches. And it's likely that these were the parish churches of Blyber and Walberswick. 
So from the 12th century um, to the dissolution of the Priory in 1537, uh, Blytheborough's Prior was the rector of Blytheborough. Um, a time team excavation um, of the Priory site um, uh, occurred a few years ago, and here Here's a con conjectural view of, of Blytheborough Priory in, in the 13th century, built around a, a cruciform church. Um, and here's a rather fanciful view of what Blytheborough might have looked at in the 14th century with, 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 with a large priory church. That church was probably as long as the present parish church. It's a pity that the parish church in the background has been drawn the wrong way round. Um, but here, here's some idea of just how impressive a view uh, Blytheborough would have, would have presented at that time. Here's Blytheborough Church. Um, rebuilt in a grand manner in the 15th century. Now, this did not reflect either a rich community or a populous community. Um, it reflects instead the, the 15th century obsession with, with the fate of souls after death. And, and this is described by uh, historian Eamon Duffy. Uh, he says, the extensive and often sumptuous rebuilding of so many of the churches of East Anglia in the 15th century was an expression not simply of bourgeois prosperity, but the concern of the rich to use their wealth as post-mortem fire insurance. Uh, Blyther was certainly a testimony of the desire of the Lords of the Manor uh, to give a permanent reminder to their neighbours of their family wealth and status. But first and foremost, uh, their benefactions were prompted by a concern to erect before God a permanent witness to their piety and charity, which would plead for them at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, it's important to note that this group of coastal churches, they're not wool churches, uh, uh, as some of the churches in uh, southwest Suffolk are. Uh, these were churches based on money uh, derived from general agriculture, from fishing, uh, and to some extent from trade. And it's a bit more complicated than that for Blytheborough, because the Lord of the Manor was drawing more income from his estates in Yorkshire uh, than his estates in Suffolk. Um, so it could have been Yorkshire money. And there were many small benefactors as well. My favourite possibly is Alice Stapleton. We, we know about her because uh, she was in court for keeping the Blytheborough brothel. Now, uh, she donated money for um, a cover for the altar, uh, and it was suggested to me on one occasion that Blyber was built out of Yorkshire money and immoral earnings. Now, literally true, but perhaps the weight of the argument is a little skewed. But this grand church um, was an unfortunate legacy for future generations because it was very expensive in, in relation to the community's resources and it proved to be an, an unsupportable burden. And, and the problems for the community were um, amplified by a series of events. Of course, there was the dissolution of the uh, Priory in 1537, uh, whatever property it had uh, passed into the hands of a lay rector uh, and the, uh, uh, the parish church was cast adrift uh, without any endowments. In 1577, uh, a violent thunderstorm damaged the church uh, uh, and two people inside the church were, were killed by lightning. And if that was not enough, in, in the very difficult 17th century in 1644, uh, the, the iconoclast William Dowsing visited the church, uh, stained glass and other supposedly superstitious images were smashed. Um, the decorative panels on the seven sacrament font were chiseled flat. Uh, the angel roof was targeted, but uh, its height seems to have put it beyond reach, uh, and it survived that. Um, but the, the size and wealth of Blyber declined steadily. Uh, in 1676, there was a disastrous fire, uh, and Blyber was reduced to poverty. Now, although the, proper, the, the population did rise uh, during the 19th century, um, Although today Blyber has about 300 inhabitants um, in the 19th century during the church restoration, it had almost double that. Uh, Blyber was a community of 
poorly paid uh, farm laborers uh, and, and small shopkeepers uh, and a handful of uh, farmers were, were tenants of, of large estates. And you won't find substantial buildings of the 18th and 19th century in Bybra. Um, no prominent citizen or merchant uh, chose to build there. Uh, and the, the church's patron and, and the vicar, uh, they both lived elsewhere. So the church moulded away. And if the local population um, worshipped at all, um, they were likely to be in, in Blyber's primitive Methodist chapel um, for over 100 years. Um, this um, little building um, played numerically at least a more, more prominent role in, in the Blyber community than, than the parish church did because the, the Methodist chapel um, uh, congregations far exceeded those of the parish church. But concern about the prospects for Blyber were very real. Um, consider the church of Warburswick as, as part of the same uh, living um, dismantled in the 1690s because it was too expensive for the uh, community to maintain. And consider too uh, the church of St Andrew's Cove High, a little further up the coast, a parish that was being steadily washed away by the sea. Uh, today it has a population of about 20 and that church was reduced in size in the 1670s. Cove High was actually larger than Blytheborough. So the concern about Blybra and its possible fate was very real. Now in 1879, a very determined new vicar, the Reverend Henry Sykes came to Blythburgh. He was in his forties. Um, and when the church was closed in 1881, he was determined to do something about it. Uh, so he, he called a, a meeting of parishioners um, encouraging them with these words, as the church belongs to the whole parish, it is hoped all will feel a deep interest in preserving our holy and our beautiful house, which our fathers praise uh, from further decay, and in handing down to future generations this noble, noble monument of the piety of uh, former times. Now, the parishioners squeezed into Blytheborough's National School and they, they formed a committee headed by the Reverend Sykes uh, and it comprised um, the church wardens, um, local um, tenant farmers, um, the rural dean, um, two names added later, a uh, uh, solicitor and Lady Blois, uh, wife of, of the patron, but um, the wives of the, the key men were also on this committee. Um, it was agreed to write to the architect George Edmund Street um, to get his fee for inspecting the church and, and reporting on its condition. Now, uh, Street was a leading architect of the day. He'd um, built or restored hundreds of churches. He, he was a great campaigner uh, for the early Gothic style. He hadn't done a lot of work in Suffolk, um, but Sykes had been advised by the vicar of at St. Peter Mancroft in Norwich that, quote, street knows better how to touch old buildings without disenchanting them of their own special character than perhaps any living architect. Now, TV viewers of uh, news programs, at least, will be familiar with uh, one of uh, streets uh, major works, uh, that is the law courts in the Strand, outside which uh, many interviews are conducted uh, during or after important uh, legal proceedings. Street visited the church uh, in November 1881, uh, but his involvement was very brief because he died in December, and it was his son Arthur E. Street who completed his proposal for Blyborough, and they were with Sykes by the end of the year. Our street proposed a, an extensive program of work. He was going to re-lead the chancel roof. He was going to renew bays at the west end of the nave roof. He was going to repair the north and south aisles, 
the windows in the clerestory would be unblocked uh, and also those in the chancel and nave aisles and the east and west windows and, and the tracery would be restored. Uh, the stonework of the nave columns and arches would be cleaned and the nave replastered. Uh, monumental stones in the floor would be relayed and the church paved with glazed and encaustic tiles. Although the street noted that money could be saved uh, by using simpler tiles. Another work included the renewal of six angels in the roof, the restoration of the screen, the removal of the brick piers from the Hopton tomb and the repair of the wall above it. Externally, work was needed on the south porch, the parapet of the south aisle, uh, the plinths and walls of the church and the tower. Now, the total cost of this work was estimated to be £4,875, a vast sum. It, <coughs> it could be as much as uh, three quarters of a million today, um, £4,875. Um, the church wardens had just over £44 in the bank. The architect's report was discussed and forwarded to the Bishop of Norwich, and he suggested uh, dividing the work into three classes. That was most urgent, some that might be postponed and some that might indeed be questionable, and that the architect should be uh, invited to provide estimates for these different classes of work. Um, the committee decided that the restoration of the church and chancel should be proceeded as one work uh, with the funds invested in the names of the vicar and the church warden, and the architect should be instructed to prepare plans and specification for a new roof for the south aisle, alongside both the nave and chancel. He should be instructed to consider the repair of the South Isle parapet and, and for those windows considered to be in a dangerous condition. Um, and that would leave untouched uh, the roofs of the nave and the North Isle, both in a bad state, uh, many of the bricked up windows and the seating and flooring of the church. But the committee was, was running ahead of itself. Um, the Archdeacon told the committee it didn't have the authority to carry out the work. Um, the resolutions could not be executed, only the vestry uh, could take such decisions. So the committee decided to adopt Street's reduced plans, ask him to pre prepare specifications so that they could be submitted to a, a vestry meeting. And this was done uh, and the, the plans were finally approved by the Bishop in July, 1882. Now a notable absentee at this stage was the lay rector, Sir John Bloys, spelled B-L-O-I-S, Sir John Bloys, Baronet. Now he was of course uh, responsible for the maintenance of the chancel. Now Lady Bloys's committee had been added to, uh, Lady Bloys's name had been added to the committee early in 1882, but it became clear to the Bloys family, um, aware of their responsibility for the chancel, uh, that they could not accept uh, the committee's original position that the church should be considered as a whole and only one fund should be invested. Uh, so Lady Bloys proposed the funds collected should always be divided, subject to the approval of the Archdeacon and the Bishop, uh, two thirds to the church and one third to the Chancel and, and the Restoration Committee accepted this. Now the, the involvement of the, the Bloys family was really crucial for fundraising. Um, Lady Bloys arranged a, an amateur concert in London that raised £54 and uh, Mr Doyley Cart of the Doyley Cart Opera gave permission for the performance of a selection from his um, patients, uh, which was enjoyed, according to the press, by a fashionable audience. Um, London support of the church responded by forming a committee uh, to raise, as they put it, the necessary funds to render the edifice safe and fit for public worship. Uh, Fundraising events in Blybra, including an entertainment in the school and a concert of the Bloys family in Oxford, not far from Blybra, um, raised more money. And the Blybra Bazaar uh, was held in the summer of uh, 1882 under the patronage of um, eminent local ladies, including the Countess uh, Stradbrook, 
uh, Lady Constance Spahn, Lady Huntingfield, Lady Blois, Lady Knightley and others. Um, and that event was held in a meadow behind the village pub, the White Hart, and it, the result exceeded all expectations and it raised over 200 pounds. Now, there were long and detailed accounts of that event in the local press, and they stressed the lead taken by Lady Blois in the campaign to restore the church. And these reports incensed the vicar, um, and, and this precipitated public attacks by him uh, on, on the Blois family. And you can see uh, from these annotations in the Restoration Committee Minute book where, where Sykes has pasted in an account a newspaper account of the bazaar. He has annotated it um, with um, critical comments against the mention that uh, Sir John and Lady Blois have been the principal movers. Uh, Sykes wrote a pure invention. Uh, the newspaper stated that Lady Blois had secured all the subscriptions up to the date of the bazaar. Uh, and Sykes wrote alongside Lady Blois helped to raise this sum, but, but he didn't stop there. He wrote to the county newspaper, the Ipswich Journal, with an, an explicit attack on, on uh, Sir John. And he, his main point uh, that was that um, the key people in, in, in the restoration movement had been unfairly ignored. Um, Sykes claimed that to had the preservation of the church depended uh, upon Lady Blois and the cooperation of John, quote, it is to be feared that the church must have become a heap of ruins. And, and Sykes wrote intriguingly, I might add much more, but I forbear. And the paper published another article, a uh, critical article, uh, uh, a letter from East Suffolk over the pseudonym Churchman, uh, and I suspect this might have been Sykes himself. Uh, the writer referred to the inadequate example that uh, Sir John had said, uh, his contribution should be 500 pounds, the writer asserted, not the 100 pounds with which he had headed the list of sub subscribers. Uh, a printed appeal lef leaflet was circulated in August 82. At that stage, the sum collected was just under uh, 600 pounds. Uh, so there was still a very long way to go. And that sum was being divided, two thirds of the church and one third of the chancel, uh, as Lady Blois had proposed. Uh, and the bizarre funds had been uh, invested by her, uh, and Sykes invested the funds contributed separately to the church directly and, for example, in local communities like Southwold. And that separation was maintained throughout the project, and the parties agreed to, re, uh, to release money under their control in the agreed proportions. Um, Tenders were invited uh, from five building contractors uh, uh, and they were received in 1882. Uh, the lowest tender was for just over 1,000 uh, pounds for that reduced street scheme. And it was submitted by a Southwold builder, uh, RJ Allen. And, and within, within that cost, um, the chancel was expected to cost 363 pounds, which was just over one third of the total. Now, Sir John Blois attended a committee meeting for the first time in September 1882. That's almost a year after the church had been closed. And it must have been an uncomfortable moment, I guess, for the Reverend Sykes. But Sir John set the committee in a more business-like direction. Uh, a smaller building committee was formed and the architect was asked how the restoration work could be adjusted to meet the sum of 730 pounds uh, then available. But the, the committee was unable to proceed with the contracts because uh, Sir John Blois um, said he was unwilling to re release any money um, uh, from accounts under his control because it wasn't clear what part of the, the building actually comprised the chancel uh, for which he was responsible. Um, was this the chancel? Or did the chancel, or did the chancel include the, the the chapel and the vestry to the east of the screen? Well, 
that question was, was still open in, in January 1883, um, but uh, John, Sir John w w was then willing to release funds. The, 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 local, the local lowest tender was accepted and, and the Southall builder asked to start work in the spring of 1883. But money, money was not there to, to cover the whole of the work and, and the builder was asked not to press for payment uh, for the whole amount of the contract until the required sum had been collected. Um, but the Reverend Sykes, having already attacked Sir John Bloys in the public press, now found himself in, in dispute with the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, SPAB. The prospect uh, that Bliber would be restored had come to their attention. Uh, it was alerted to that newspaper report uh, in the Morning Post. Uh, uh, and uh, throughout um, SPAB's activities, uh, a network of such supporters were, was very important uh, as a source of information for the society. It was still quite a young society. It, it had been founded in March 1877 and the creation of William Morris, its uh, first secretary and a uh, treasurer. Uh, 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 as a response to the threat of uh, drastic uh, restoration of medieval buildings, uh, which could result in, in their total destruction. <clears throat> now, Morris um, deplored um, the re reckless stripping from buildings of some of the most interesting features uh, so that um, the process could be stopped at uh, some arbitrary point in the past uh, for what he regarded as the imaginative recreation of what earlier builders should or might have done. Um, to Morris, the unsightliness of a structural aid didn't matter. He said, quote, better a crutch than a lost limb. Uh, architects should not attempt to restore a building to, quote, the best time in its history because the result was sheer fakery. Now, remember that the term restoration had a very distinctive and restrict a restricted meaning at that time. Uh, it, it, it's perhaps um, lost some of that um, uh, connotation today. Now, Morris knew um, Bliber, he'd visited the church in the 1860s, and it was regarded by Spab as a very important unrestored building. Uh, the choice of G Street uh, as architect especially um, alarmed Spab. Uh, it's rather ironic uh, that uh, William Morris had been an apprentice in his office at one time. But the immediate spur to the foundation of SPAB had been a visit by Morris to Burford Church in Oxfordshire, which was being restored by Street. Uh, and Morris stated that Street, quote, would restore every building in England if he could, and to our minds with the necessary result of uh, ruining them. SPAB sent their architect, um, Philip Webb, um, to um, in January 82 uh, to report on the church and, and, and we're pretty much agreed uh, with with Street uh, on uh, the, the, the state of the church um, but um, Spab's approach uh, to um, dealing with the problem was uncompromising and, and quite different. Um, you, you can see from this, this view of the South Isle um, the, the white painted um, screen of which the scent had gone and, and you can see some of the box pews um, obscuring medieval benches. Now Webb recommended uh, that on no account should the repair, repairs be let on contract for the whole, that is a contract for a fixed price. Now th this type of contracting was distru distrust, uh, distrusted. Um, it might um, be that uh, for a complicated project, it's very difficult to, for, a, for a contractor to come up with a reliable estimate. There was always a risk uh, that the work could be skimped uh, in order to maximize profit uh, and the standard of workmanship couldn't be assured. Um, it was much better, um, Spad thought, to employ an experienced clerk of the works who would let portions of the work to different tradesmen who would work under close supervision. Now, that contracting process chosen for Blybra was the very reverse 
of, of what uh, SPAB desired. Um, the rigorous um, application of SPAB's policy, um, uh, their wish to preserve existing fabric and the avoidance of restoration is exemplified in Webb's approach to the window tracery. Um, he wrote, where any window, any window mullions and tracery are too much decayed or too unstable to, remem to be remedied by slight though carefully done repairs, it would be well to brick them up, uh, there being an excess of light in the church. Now, unquote. Just imagine the, the appearance of the church today if, if that policy had been followed. Um, Webb concluded that, that the church was generally in a satisfactory condition, its appearance was uh, most dignified and uninjured by the restorer. What Webb saw was not dilapidation and makeshift repairs, but a, a building that revealed a history well worth preserving. Then followed a very frustrating period for SPAB as it sought to see Street's proposals. Uh, and it was clear that the vicar was being deliberately obstructive. Um, he wrote to SPAB that the papers were with the bishop and would be put before the Blythe Committee on their return. If a report from SPAB reached him in time, it could also be put before his committee. But it wasn't until July 1882 that SPAB was to see any of the plans, and that was after the bishop had approved Street's proposals. Now, a second visit to Bliber was made on behalf of SPAB in August 82, and again SPAB considered the church to be generally in a substantial condition and stress. There's no reason why any money subscribed for its repair should be used for any of the purposes usually included in a scheme of restoration. Sykes acknowledged receipt of SPAB's report and wrote that it had been brought before his building committee. Now, significantly in the building committee minutes, there's not a single reference to SPAB um, or the receipt or discussion of it, 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 its report. Um, and weeks passed by uh, and SPAB still awaited a response from Blybra. Uh, and they became aware of letters from Sykes published in the Ipswich Journal. Um, and they, they saw there that it was reported that as soon as weather permitted, the contractor would commence on the actual work of restoration. Now SPAB, Sykes responded to SPAB um, nearly four months after he'd received their report. Um, and three weeks after contracts had been signed. And Spab's report, Sykes wrote, had been carefully perused by every member of the building committee. Now, I doubt that. Um, Sykes wrote that Spab's proposals were simply inadmissible. Um, Spab's scheme would result in the church being further disfigured by unsightly makeshifts. The ultimate result would be that every window would have to be bricked up and the church rendered useless as a place of worship. And Sykes uh, threw down a gauntlet. Um, he said if the society could raise money for the execution of its scheme, it might be wise for the building committee to put the work in the society hands and devote themselves to raising funds to build a chapel of ease. Now, so Spab were intensely frustrated at, at its inability to influence uh, events at uh, Blyborough, and they considered uh, that they too had to resort to the newspapers. So the Society wrote lengthy newspapers published in the Ipswich Journal and Suffolk Chronicle, presenting the restoration versus conservation arguments. And they didn't mince words. Um, they did. <coughs> They, uh, no, so they didn't mince words. Um, they described the machine made so called cathedral glass being used in the windows as the most offensive and vulgar of all glazing materials. And with this, they said, and uh, such like vulgarities, the beautiful architecture of Blyborough Church would be replaced, uh, spab attacked 
the delusive and mischievous present pretense of restoration. Now Sykes responded uh, with a speed that he had failed to show uh, in dealing with Spab's report. Um, he immediately uh, responded to the newspapers and, and countered Spab's arguments. Um, he claimed that Spab's proposals had come too late to be of service to the Restoration Committee. He describes Spab as an irresponsible body of men uh, who were most unreasonable to expect the work of 11 months to be set aside in deference to last minute suggestions. Sykes asserted that were, it were impossible to paint the hideous picture the church would present if treated in the manner suggested by Spab. And in a letter to a supporter, Sykes wrote, I'll say privately to you that I would not have promised a subscription myself to carry out the recommendations of their committee, nor would I have dared to appeal to the country for such an object as they have in view. So Spad then tried a new approach. Um, they arranged a meeting with Sir John Bloys. And a note of that discussion is very interesting. Uh, Sir John sympathised generally with, with the society and agreed with their views uh, as far as he, he had seen them, although he couldn't see why the society could object to the replacement of rotten wooden windows by new stone tracery. Uh, Sir John reported that only £1,000 had been collected thus far, and he thought that the correspondence in the papers was harming the campaign for subscriptions. And there were some remarkably frank um, criticisms of the vicar. Um, John described Sykes as, quote, no one. He is hopeless. He is only a commercial traveller. The bishop appointed him by mistake. Now it's relevant to note here that the status of the vicar, he was a perpetual curate appointed by the bishop, um, arising from the fact that at the time of the Priory's dissolution that, that the church was appropriated to it. Um, as lay rector, um, Sir John could still make a recommendation to the vicar, to the bishop, but he didn't have the, the direct right to present someone to the living. Um, that was the responsibility of the bishop. And I believe that Sir John even neglected to make any recommendation. So the public dispute continued um, it, through March and April 83. The separate London Committee, which had been set up um, in 1882, that was dissolved because, because they had received no money at all. And the SPAB file on, on this phase it is silent after April 1883. Uh, they made their final appeal to subscribers through, through the papers, asking whether subscribers had fully considered their duty towards the building, which is now practically at their mercy. And in his report to the annual meeting SPAB in, in June 83, uh, William Morris referred to their ill success at Blytheborough. Instead of a moderate and carefully considered plan for the repair of the building, the local committee had preferred the one which offered all the attractions of modern cathedral glass, shiny encaustic tiles, new carving, and the ordinary paraphernalia supplied by the fashionable ecclesiastical tailors. Uh, the estimate for this was a minimum of £5,000 against the £2,000 for which the really necessary work might have been done. So what had been achieved at Blybra uh, for a church which was reopened in 1884? Now the south aisle had a new roof of English oak and the lead had been recast. The parapet on the south aisle had been secured. All the windows had been restored except two in the chancel, six in the clear story on the north side and, and uh, one in the north door. Um, those remaining nine windows were, were still bricked up. Here's an example here of a completely bricked up window. Now all the, the stalls in the chancel uh, had been moved further apart. Now, the floor uh, where necessary had been leveled 
uh, and uh, repaired with light colored bricks, but uh, never with the feared encaustic tiles. Uh, the leads on the roofs of the nave and north aisle had been repaired. Um, ancient colored glass uh, remaining in the windows have been cleaned and replaced with new lead uh, and six new colored emblems paid for by a subscriber had been placed in the south windows. Now the old box pews had gone, those that had been described as sheep pens um, and, and the medieval benches uh, revealed. Um, but the floor is an example of, of work constrained by lack of, of money. Um, but the cost of this work was just over £1,000 and when it was completed uh, there was £958 available, available to pay for it and so Sykes made further appeals through the press. The Builder Committee uh, looked forward uh, to the restoration of the nave and roof aisles and uh, uh, nave and north aisle roofs, uh, and plans were prepared uh, and they were sanctioned by the committee and marshaled forward to the bishop for approval. Uh, but by the end of March 1884, the sum collected was still only £1,065, not enough to pay for the first stage of restoration, let alone to do any more work. At the last meeting of the, the building committee, um, Sir John Blois expressed his satisfaction uh, with the manner in which the business had been conducted, but he announced then that uh, he and Lady Blois would retire from the committee um, at, at the completion of the present contract. Um, here, here's a note of, of that in, in the, the committee's minute book. There are three lines scored against that uh, Blois announcement, uh, and I wonder that was that was emphasis uh, by the chairman Sykes uh, placed against that uh, particular um, resignation. So the, the restored church, um, it opened in April, Easter day, April 1884, and it had been closed for two and a half years. Um, two days of services included an address from the Bishop of Norwich and there were extensive um, reports in the local press, which this time gave Sykes full credit uh, for the energy with which he had um, promoted uh, and managed the restoration campaign. Uh, he was congratulated for his, his indomitable efforts and his near accomplishment of, of the first portion of the work. Um, the Bil Builder Committee uh, decided um, uh, after what was described as a desultory uh, con conversation not to apply for a, a Building Society grant, not to hold any more fundraising bazaars. Um, with the church uh, open again after a really hard and for some a bruising campaign, uh, it was clear that there was no enthusiasm for more of the same. But there's a lot still to be done. Um, since the reopening, a, a beam had fallen from the North Isle roof. Uh, other parts of the church required immediate attention, but there was still money owed on that for first contract. Um, raising further money was going to be a formidable task. Now it's interesting to look at uh, where this um, money had come from. Um, events were important, uh, especially that bazaar in, in Blyber, which raised over 200 pounds. The gentry, um, largely um, friends and relations of the Boyce family, they were extremely important, and the clergy. Um, largely the Suffolk clergy or clergy elsewhere who had at one time in, in, in their careers uh, been in Suffolk. But money collected by church wardens, collected by individuals and in the collection box, very, very small amounts are derived in that. Other individuals uh, in responding to the um, campaign for uh, contributions, uh, that was a very important sum overall. But within that, um, there would have been further uh, gentry families whose names can't be identified uh, specifically. Uh, something can be said about all of this, that most of the money came from Suffolk or from people who had connections with Suffolk. Um, the London uh, uh, committee raised no money at all. Uh, so 
it was essentially a county affair. After um, the opening, uh, the, the public appeal continued, but it was raising only about £11 a month. Um, so discouragingly, um, uh, six months after the church was reopened, there was only a total of £35 raised. Uh, and of this, most of it came from donations from past subscribers. So as time went on, Blyther found it increasingly difficult uh, to raise money. So John Bloys had um, headed the subscription list with a donation of £100, and he was criticised for his parsimony. Um, Maybe we should excuse Sir John because um, the landed families have been hit very hard by the agricultural depression starting in the 1870s. And I don't know how much Sir John's rental income had gone down, but in, in the neighbouring Henham estate, um, uh, uh, the estate of rents had fallen by 60% in, in the space of 10 years. Uh, but Sir John was responsible for the upkeep of the Chancellor. Um, and uh, the one third of his donation that went to the chancel was his only direct contribution to that 363 pound cost. And the balance over 90% uh, came from the restoration appeal. Uh, but before condemning Sir John, we, we, we should remember that uh, without the Blois family, um, their own donations, the income from events that uh, they organized um, and the subscribers they encourage, that the money collected would, be, would have been very, very much less. But uh, let's not let Sir John off the hook completely. Um, uh, Lady Blois prevented him from attending church uh, because he insisted on reading the Times during the sermon. Yet, uh, we, even with the efforts of the Blois family, less than a quarter of that original estimate uh, required to restore the church was collected. Um, if the extent of um, restoration were, was not constrained directly by SPAB's efforts, um, SPAB's um, opposition to what was being done probably did result in a reduction in subscriptions. Um, uh, so although Sykes won a victory, it, it was a, a Pyrrhic one. Now, in 1889, a new vicar uh, arrived at Blythburgh, the Reverend Thomas Henry Royal Oaks, and he was another combative individual. He questioned the bishop, he fell out with parishioners, he fell out with the vestry, he fought the parish council, and he had a tetchy relationship with, with the Blois family, headed now by Sir Ralph Blois, who had succeeded his father, Sir John. And Reverend Oaks um, so annoyed the architect Arthur Street that Street washed his hands of Blythra. Um, some further restoration work was done by uh, June 1890, and at that stage it was still in the hands of Street and the South Ward contractor Allen. Uh, uh, the roof and wall of the North Isle were restored. Um, but as before, um, work went ahead before money had been collected. Um, work costing £500 was done and Blyborough had only £300 in hand. There's an example of uh, the, the sort of plan that Arthur Street grew up. And, and the dispute um, between Oaks and Street was over the ownership of drawings. Um, Street argued that payment uh, was for the preparation of drawings and not their ownership. And, and Oakes accused, uh, believing that he should have the drawings, Oakes accused Street of bad faith and extravagance. Uh, uh, and Street responded bluntly, quote, it does not encourage me to do work for nothing if the sole result is an abrupt stand and deliver uh, without a semblance of thanks. Street supposed that Oakes was not aware of what was usually done, and that in 10 years of architectural practice, he had never been asked to hand over drawings. 
uh, Street found it especially odd that this first case should be one where he was actually out of pocket. Uh, and in July 1890, Street did wash his hands of Blyborough saying, I think we had better have no fresh business transactions. Um, Spab re returned um, to the scene uh, in 1894 uh, because a subscriber wrote to them uh, that the South Porch was in danger of collapse. Uh, uh, and the sport supporter referred to a restoration of Blyborough Church, quote, now in progress, and the careless treatment of painted glass windows, uh, such fragments of which had uh, had not been stolen, uh, were lying around in confusion. Um, the re reporter regretted that the services of a well-known uh, and well-informed local antiquarian called Hamlet Watling um, had not been um, uh, uh, consulted in, in the rearrangement of the glass. Um, because unless Spab intervened, uh, a large number of most valuable in, and interesting windows would be utterly dispersed and destroyed. Now, this is an indication that the 17th century iconoclasts had not destroyed all the window glass. Uh, some had survived, but it was gradually disappearing uh, in the neglect of the 19th century. And Hamlet Watling actually made some invaluable watercolors of, of the, the glass at Blybra, uh, surviving in the mid 19th century, a uh, complete uh, runs of uh, the apostles, complete runs of the bishops of Dunedge, complete runs of old um, Anglo Saxon saints. Um, so there were fragments of this to be swept up and um, retained. So Spab wrote to the vicar. Um, asking if anything was being done. And the response was um, <clears throat> they were still trying to obtain funds. Uh, the South Porch was certainly falling into ruins, but they, they couldn't do anything about it without money. Um, Spab responded, uh, restating the philosophy regarding restoration. Um, and uh, Spab's secretary, uh, Thackeray Turner, and William Morris visited Blyborough in 1895. Um, the Reverend Oaks seemed to want to minimize the time they spent in Blyborough, and he encouraged them to start in Warberswick, uh, inspect the church there, and then after lunch go the three miles to Blyborough. Um, that proposal was rejected, and Turner and Morris went directly to Blyborough and spent all day there. Now, after the visit, uh, a report was written and Spab reiterated its rigorous position on the subject of restoration. And they repeated um, Philip Webb's um, comment of 1882 on the windows. Um, the new report said the church is so light already that nothing would be gained by opening out any of the blocked up windows. There were still nine blocked up. Uh, the most urgent work should be done first, says Spab, and that included attention to the South Porch. Um, but um, Vickers didn't stay long at Blyborough, and Oakes was soon gone, and a, a new vicar came, the Reverend Woodworth, Woodruff, in, in 1897, and uh, no major work would be done on the church for another seven years. Blyborough remained uh, very short of money. Uh, another appeal was launched in uh, uh, 1901, um, and uh, this was when the church wardens had 70 pounds in the bank. Um, the South Porch was referred to in, in, in this appeal, but uh, no um, work was done. The Reverend Woodruff wrote to the Times newspaper asking for help. He described church as being still in peril and he put its state in the context of part ruined Walberswick and Covehithe and indeed threatened Dunwich, which had almost completely disappeared into the sea. Um, part of Blyber's roof was in danger in 1901 and the South Porch uh, about which uh, concern had been expressed seven years before, that was on the point of collapse. 
Now Spab saw that letter and asked the vicar for more information and they learned that an architect would visit soon and a report upon the problems. Um, when they read his report, um, Spab, quote, were absolutely astonished and taken aback by what they read. Uh, they told the vicar that the society had not seen, quote, such drastic and thoroughgoing restoration advocated for many a year. It was unthinkable that uh, Blytheborough as wide world reputation should be treated in such a way. Now, unfortunately, I, I haven't been able to trace that architect's report. Um, he was the little known uh, American educated Charles Ford Whitcomb. And he does pop up in the Pevsler volume for Worcestershire. Uh, but there's a clue to Spab's objections in, in the 1901 appeal leaflet for Warbeswick, in which, which rebuilding of part of that ruined church was proposed. Spab expressed the hope that restoration would be abandoned and Bliber Church repaired in the simplest possible way. Uh, uh, Woodruff replied that nothing would be done while he was vicar, he was leaving and could not bind his successor. Now a significant new name appears in September 1902 and this marks a shift, shift of leadership uh, in Blyborough from the vicars to the church wardens and the new name was Claude Francis Egerton. He was a church warden. He was a professional civil engineer who practicing in London and resident in Blybra uh, and he was to play a most important role in the next four years um, with an increasingly strained relationship between SPAB and the Restoration Committee. Um, the new vicar was the Reverend Wing. Um, Spab wrote to him and stressed how shocked they were at uh, Blyber Architects' proposals um, and urged that they should not be carried out, hoping that the building would be treated in accordance with, with Spab's principles. But the society received no reply. And once again, a Spab supporter uh, visited Blyber and, and expressed concern at uh, what uh, he had seen. And that was the artist uh, uh, Joseph Southall. And at the time, uh, rain was coming through the roof and timbers were beginning to give way. Southall was asked by Spab to visit Blyborough again and, and talk to the vicar. And he did this. He met the Reverend Wing in July 1903. Um, he found that the vicar was not very interested in the artistic or historical aspect of the church. And because he had only recently come to the living, the restoration question was not altogether in his hands. Uh, Wing suggested that they should together meet the church warden Egerton. Southall wrote to Spab that the vicar was a, near, a mere nobody uh, compared to Egerton. Egerton, he wrote, is a racing man, fond of dogs and horses, but he was found to have no particular views on restoration, uh, but he wanted to raise the necessary money and was disappointed that Spab couldn't help. Um, Southall thought it fortunate that Bliber didn't have any money because Egerton had such an easy faith in their architect. Blyber had about £200 in hand, but there were some encouraging signs for Spab. Egerton seemed to understand the society's principles, although they appeared to be new to him, and he agreed that the roof, roof, the nave roof, should not be repainted. Um, Egerton, he said that he would be glad if it was not necessary to rebuild the porch. It was agreed that the church would again be inspected uh, on behalf of Spab. Um, and the architect, new architect, Alfred Powell, uh, reported on Blyber in August 1901, and he recommended that the South Port should be shored up at once, once and he impressed on the Vicar and Church Wardens that the, church, that the South Port could not possibly be done satisfactorily unless it was supervised by someone uh, recommended by Spab. This was agreed, and, and Spalf as Paul said, he'd asked the society to, to find someone as soon as possible. Paul thought that 150 pounds of the 200 pounds that Blyther had, uh, that would have to go on the porch. 
and there's a sketch of a proposal to repair the south porch uh, by Powell. The nave roof uh, was also in a very poor state. Um, you could see even from the ground that, that timbers were rotten uh, 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 and uh, the lead covering was in a bad condition throughout. There was an urgent need to erect scaffolding uh, and closely inspect that roof. Uh, the condition of the church floor and the cracked tower also attracted Powell's attention. Powell recommended that an architect be engaged who would stay at Blyder for the duration of the work. And so that architect would simply employ labor and buy materials as the work progressed. And that would ignore, uh, avoid any unnecessary profit going into contractors' hands. So SMAP continued to press for the work to be done in accordance with their principles. Egerton, um, who clearly at that stage was handling matters rather than the vicar, um, Egerton replied uh, that they wished to do nothing to the church except what was necessary to prevent further decay. They were quite willing for the work to be done under supervision of someone record recommended by SPAB. Um, and SPAB did provide Egerton with a letter to help in raising funds. Uh, and they told Powell that Blytheborough would likely be likely to engage him. Another year passed and SPAB wrote again to discover the latest position. And Egerton replied again that nothing other than shoring up the porch had been done. They were still, still raising money. They'd now got 400 pounds uh, and Powell, Powell saw no reason why work on the porch would not start, certainly no later than spring 1905. And in 1905, Sir Ralph Bloys intervened. Um, he wanted to meet Spab and he thought it absolutely necessary that the, the port and the nave roof should be repaired before the further damage was done. And, and he sought the society's views on what work should be done first. And another architect, uh, William Weir, visited um, Blytheborough in June 1905. Um, he was then 40 years old. He was a principal architect for Spab and, and a committee member. And Webb, we are reported to SPAB on, on the condition of the porch and the estimated cost of its repair was 200 pounds. Um, here's a sketch of the porch by William Weir. Now SPAB then, then learned a, a very serious setback to their hope that they would be involved because Sir Ralph reported that uh, the Archdeacon for Suffolk had said, that he would not allow Spab to touch the church, although he gave no reason. So matters were, were, were deadlocked. Uh, and Spab then decided to embark on a very high level lobbying exercise. They knew that another appeal for funds had been launched. And the 1905 appeal leaflet is a remarkable one. And, and it shows that a very fashionable um, restoration committee had been put together so different from the composition of the 1881 committee which had been reflecting uh, the blood community with for example the tenant farmers and their wives on the committee and the village school mistress here what have we got we've got the patron a daughter of queen victoria princess louise duchess of argyle and she was no um, figurehead. Um, she was a hands-on patron, um, a, a very capable sculptor in her own right, and nominally at least a supporter of SPAB. Um, we have the Bishop of Norwich and we have the Archdeacon, but we've got uh, three royal accommodations. Um, John Seymour Lucas and uh, Ernest Crofts, who were both Blythe residents. We've got Luke Files, who developed a very uh, important um, career as a, a fashionable portrait painter. We've got the director of the South Kensington Museum, which uh, became the, the, the V&A. We, of course, got the Lord of the Manor, Sir Ralph Bloys. Um, we've got um, the treasurer here. Claude Egerton. Even Egerton um, had um, 
distinguished connections. He was a member of the Luce and Gore family and he could number dukes and earls among his cousins. Uh, so this was a very brilliant um, restoration committee. Spaff set out to influence the princess uh, and they did it through her equerry, Captain Probert, uh, and they sought to put the facts before her, feeling, quote, sure that HRH would not wish to help in bringing about a restoration of the Library Church and might be willing to use her influence in favor of the repairs being carried out under the auspices of the society. Um, and Spad then uh, recruited its own royal, Prince Frederick Duleep Singh, a, a respected uh, East Anglian antiquarian. He was the son of the deposed Maharaja of the Punjab, uh, settled by the government on a Suffolk estate. And the prince established that the archdeacon had climbed down and had never meant that he had, had objected to the involvement of Spab. Um, Sir Ralph Blois asked the prince to become a member of the Bliber Committee, and he hoped that the services of Spab would be engaged immediately for the repair of the porch under the supervision of one of Spab's architects. So at last it seemed that uh, Spab would be involved uh, in the work on Bliber, and it would pr proceed in accordance with its principles. Then came another bombshell. Um, the Blythe Committee decided that the money in hand would be used to repair the roof, and under no circumstances is a society to be employed. The, the porch would be left as it is. Now, I don't know who attended that committee meeting. Uh, Sir Ralph thought its decision ill-advised. Um, who were the strong opponents of Spab Egerton, perhaps, or the Archdeacon, John Seymour Lucas, I don't know. So Spab lobbied the princess again, but the society was warned that her equerry that was um, a uh, Suffolk man, um, possibly taking the side of, of the committee, um, perhaps through ignorance, um, although he was a gentleman and, and a fair-minded man, which is a nice Edwardian touch. Um, the Bliber Committee was considering a proposed work by the architect Philip Johnson, who mostly known for work in, in Sussex. Um, we looked at his report uh, on behalf of SPAB and he was very critical, uh, but the Library Committee decided to employ Johnston if it would work under SPAB supervision. Um, so Ralph and Prince Frederick were against this arrangement, but they lost the argument. And we visited Library again and met Johnston and Weir's report on uh, him is, is damning. He, he described the work in progress at Blybra as hopeless. Um, he wrote, it appeared a great misfortune that the funds, which were not sufficient to undertake the necessary repairs, uh, should be spent in useless restoration. And Prince Frederick's view was equally damning. It was a grievous pity, he wrote, that the work ever got into the hands of such a man. It's a reminder, um, that SPAB, although uncom uncom uncompromising in its position on restoration, had much to offer. Um, uh, the architects were experienced in, in, in the dealing with uh, old buildings and, and uh, they knew a lot about how contracts should be managed. Um, but SPAB concluded that they were bound to disassociate themselves from work at Blyber, it being, it being contrary to their principles. So 25 years after their first involvement in Blyber, they felt they had to walk away. Um, but if they lost the battle, perhaps the war was won. Um, Blyber was saved from uh, restoration or over-restoration by the lack of money, the decorated nave roof and the angels were never touched, the original floor um, remained and uh, the south porch was repaired instead of being rebuilt. Um, so the hands of the most enthusiastic restorers were stayed until attitudes changed. And, and a change they did because um, 
William Weir, the architect whose critical report had been a significant factor in, in Spab's withdrawal, he maintained an interest in the church, but now in, in writing reports in 1926, 1933 and 1947, uh, the context was very different. He was working now in the diocese uh, for um, a newly created advisory committee. Um, Blind was now in the Diocese of St Edmundsbury and Ipswich, no longer in Norwich. Um, now these committees no longer were not decision-making bodies, um, uh, but they helped to ensure that work on buildings was done in accordance uh, with uh, respect for the historic building uh, importance of, of a building, uh, while maintaining it, of course, as a functioning place of worship. Um, and uh, at last, um, following one of Weir's visits, those um, brick pillars were, were finally removed from uh, John Hopton's tomb in the 1930s, having been noticed in 1808 and were obviously there before that. And it was a survey of the church in 1981 that concluded it should be recorded with triumph that the major overhaul of the building undertaken by the parish in 1931 is now, after 50 years, complete. The church is safe for the conceivable future. Now that should really have read a hundred years after the work to save Blythe Church began. Um, restoration in church, always constrained by lack of money, uh, proceeded very slowly. Now, the story is in the book um, uh, published by Bordell for the um, Suffolk Record Society, but um, it's worth considering um, with hindsight um, whether uh, Spab's contention that the damaged window should not be opened up. Um, that was a position so unacceptable to the Restoration Committee. Now, Blyber Church today, uh, apart from being a, a living place for worship, um, is, is very much a community asset. Um, and uh, outside the COVID-19 crisis, uh, it has found many uses. I mean, it houses animal services, concerts, drama, exhibitions, Christmas markets, coffee mornings, um, and attracts many thousands of visitors a year. We're, we're talking uh, before COVID over 10,000. Um, now, would the church have found so many community uses if it had been left as light enough as it is? Um, for the last word on that, I, I, I think we could go to uh, Spab itself. Um, their reviewer of uh, my book on the restoration said this, um, one nagging, possibly heretical question remains, was, the, was Spab right to argue unsuccessfully that it was better to brick up windows than to restore lost tracery? Go to Blybra and uh, judge for yourself. No, I couldn't put it better myself. Thank you so much, Alan. That's um, that's been absolutely um, fantastic. I'm just going to end your um, screen there. Thank you so much, and um, thank you everyone for your questions. I'm aware that we have slightly overrun today, um, so apologies for that. Um, but um, there have been some great questions that have come in. So what we're going to do is that I'm going to um, have follow up with Alan, and we're going to answer those questions, and we'll um, get back to everyone individually because I'm just a bit aware of the time. But everyone, thank you so much for joining us. And Alan, again, that's been um, fantastic. And that, that the comments that have come in have been wonderful. Um, so all that remains, everyone, is um, obviously once lockdown is finished, hopefully we'll be able to go and visit this wonderful, wonderful church and um, see for it ourselves. Um, now, um, for those of you who've joined us for the first time today, do have a look on our Facebook events page. We've got details of further upcoming weekly lectures. Um, so next week we're going to be joined by TV broadcaster John Cannon, who's going to be talking to us about the medieval um, parish church and how they stayed in style um, with architecture. So do join us next um, week for that. But as I said at the start of this lecture, um, if you have enjoyed these lectures, um, please do consider supporting our work. Um, and there's a few ways that you can do that. So if you've enjoyed this free lecture, please do um, make a donation. So you can donate CCT to 70331 to give us a gift of three pounds. If you think it's worth a bit more than three pounds though, um, please do you know, donate CCT, text, sorry, CCT, 
to 70191 and that will give us a gift of £10 but also um, if you wanted to um, support us uh, a bit more um, you can join us as a member from just £3.50 per month um, and if you do that at the moment and if you use the offer code lecture um, when you join us by direct debit you'll get a free copy of Beautiful Churches um, which is a really fantastic book. But all that remains to be said is, again, thank you, Alan, so much for your time today. Um, we really appreciate um, that was really such a fascinating lecture. And thank you, everyone, for um, joining us for another Thursday lunchtime lecture. We look forward to seeing you next week. Um, but if you've got any questions, um, do comment away. And any suggestions for future lecture topics, please do let us know. But everyone, I hope you have a great week. And again, thank you so much for joining us today.